Hi, my name is Jeff Haney, and I work with a company called Absolerator here in Mountain View. So today I'm going to talk about mobile as it relates to JavaScript. How many people are doing JavaScript-based mobile applications? Okay, nobody. One, All right. two, maybe. So, um, so we're, we're going to talk today a little bit about a product we've been working on and, and sort of um, some of the solutions that we're trying to focus on around mobile and mobile enablement, especially for next generation phones like the Android devices and the iPhone, and how we can use next generation web standards to actually build those types of applications. Um, we've had an explosion of mobile applications, as everybody's well aware, and, and uh, focused on, um, especially in the iPhone and, and Android space with all the emergence of uh, the, the new SDKs and the new cool phones. Um, but to some degree, it's locked a lot of us out who aren't Objective-C programmers, uh, don't have a heavy C++ background or Java background. Um, that's, that's sort of one part. The other part is just the speed it takes to actually build some of these applications uh, and, and how you actually integrate those applications into your backend infrastructure, use existing tools and skills and things like that. So certainly there's also a, a kind of a ROI angle to this. So, um, so as I start, just a little bit about me. Um, I Twitter at Jay Haney. Um, I blog not as much as I used to at, uh, probably like a lot of us, uh, at uh, that address. And you can always reach me at, uh, um, either via email uh, or on IRC at uh, Titanium App. So my company really is focused on the empowerment of uh, empowering developers to create these next-gen applications, both for web, desktop, and mobile applications. So that's really what we're focused on. It's an open source platform. Uh, we've created a business around it, um, and we work with people all over the world building applications. Um, we're really uh, passionate about empowering developers. We're developers, and we feel like we're building solutions for developers. Um, and our focus really is around web technologies and web people. Um, you know, if you, if you, if you like Objective-C, there's nothing wrong with that. Go, go do Objective-C. Uh, no different than if you like C++ and CGI back in the old days, you can do that too. So we're really about how do you sort of move the web and how do you sort of leverage the web today as it exists today and, and sort of the next generation of types of phones and applications and desktops and now the emerging netbook marketplace. So our products really are, they're all open source um, and focused around, um, mainly around web, desktop, and mobile. We just recently introduced uh, Titanium Mobile. Um, that's kind of our new flagship product. Titanium Desktop is a direct competitor to Air, um, Adobe Air. Um, it allows you to actually build kind of very rich desktop applications that, that they, much different than Air, they don't actually have a security sandbox. So they actually allow you to actually use JavaScript, Ruby, Python, and HTML, CSS to actually build these native ap applications. They compile down to native applications that run across, you know, OS X, Linux, uh, PC platforms, et cetera. Um, and, and they don't require a pre-installed runtime. So they're much different than Air, but very similar technologies. Um, all of the technologies that we build, um, we've embedded WebKit. So um, you get sort of the best of the best of the best uh, as far as uh, uh, kind of browser technology from a rendering standpoint. Um, we're kind of a heavy developer around WebKit and, um, and uh, have done a lot of work around WebKit. And uh, we're on pretty much the latest WebKit. So we're on, uh, as of our latest release about four weeks ago, we're, we're right around Safari Beta 1 of WebKit. So we're pretty much on bleeding edge of the WebKit um, stable. Um, and that, that sort of gives us a lot of really great capabilities, especially around the new CSS animation stuff, um, reflections, HTML video, uh, things like that. So uh, that's very exciting. On Titanium Mobile, of course, we run on iPhone and, and Android. So what I'm going to get into this presentation is mostly going to focus around mobile. Um, but if you'd like to learn more about desktop, just come talk to me. Uh, and then we have a, a set of cloud services around our network. Um, Things like packaging, distribution, analytics, things like that, sort of that, that add value around your application infrastructure. So the product architecture um, is very different between mobile and desktop. So conceptually, the idea is that you could actually use the same APIs, same skills, same tools, et cetera, to build between desktop and mobile. Um, but certainly, our technical architecture is much different between, um, between the desktop and mobile, which, of course, is distracted from you as a developer. Um, and we do a lot of the dirty hard work to, to make it work across multiple platforms, to multiple devices, et cetera. So on the, on, on the desktop side, um, we embed um, WebKit, and we've extended WebKit with a whole set of APIs in C++ that we've written 
Um, that are, it's all modular, so you can write your own modules if you'd like, if you know C++ um, or Python or Ruby. Um, but basically, we have a whole set of modules that are exposed via JavaScript, they're exposed via Ruby, and exposed via Python. You can mix and match any of those languages on the fly with inside your application. Um, so you can you can create you know um, you know JavaScript functions or JavaScript variables, uh, and you can pass those to a Python script using script type text Python or script type text Ruby. Um, and you have full access to the DOM, vice versa. You can pass them back and forth. So we actually embed a Ruby interpreter and a Python interpreter if you decide to actually use those languages in your application. They're optional, but if you decide to use them, we embed them in. So you have full access to uh, both those modules um, that those languages provide as well as JavaScript mix and matching them. So it sort of gives you the best of both worlds. The actual application runs in the, in the device. So they, it runs in the client. So the, the code is compiled into an application and actually runs resident, so it doesn't fetch JavaScript or HTML files from the network. They actually live physically in the uh, in the application space, and they live on the disk. Um, so you get sort of very very high performance. That you can still, of course, fetch remote resources. You can still include remote resources, etc. If you'd like, um, there's no restriction there. Um, and uh, you've, of course, got high-level access to lots of cool APIs. And I'll go through some of these, but uh, mostly around mobile, but it's a very similar API set. So you, all, all the kinds of things you expect, you know, worker threads and, and uh, file system and processes and um, you know, all sorts of things that you'd expect. You get pretty much, um, you can pretty much write um, uh, what, we've, what we, we've seen and what we've seen developers build, you can pretty much write a rivaled application if you were to write it in C++ or .NET or things like that, Java, um, and it runs cross-platform. So you get the you know, cost benefit and this development benefit of using these web technologies, packaging them as a real application, and then running them, um, running them in, your, in your desktop or eventually, very soon, netbook. Uh, on the mobile side, mobile's a very different animal. Um, from a developer standpoint, very similar development model, programming model, um, very similar, almost the same API. We probably have about 75% of the APIs are the same between mobile and desktop. But the underlying underpinnings are technology and the compiler and things like that is much different. So we, we actually, on, on mobile, um, for example, when you build an app uh, for iPhone, we will uh, compile it into Objective-C or translate into Objective-C from Java, HTML, uh, CSS, et cetera, and then compile that using Xcode underneath the cover. So you don't, you don't sort of ever really have to see this yourself. It's actually done. I'll do a demo in a little bit. But it's actually done underneath the covers, builds an actual iPhone native application, uh, and then you can deploy it in the simulator or you can run it on device, et cetera. Um, and so uh, when it's executing the widgets, things like that, they're actually real native controls, and I'll do a demo, and I'll get a lot more detail about that. Um, Android's very similar um, conceptually, but of course it uses Java and Android SDK, um, and uh, and exposes the same sort of si types of things and APIs, but in an Android-specific way. Uh, and then our network, we we provide a whole bunch of additional things that we're sort of continually layering in around collaboration and social networking and things like that, uh, analytics, etc. Yes. Yes, you can see all the Objective-C code. Um, we, we don't, uh, when we compile some of the intermediate code for your stuff, um, one of the benefits of what we do, we've had a lot of developers ask for this, we did this from the beginning, is we actually AS128 A AS encode uh, all, all your actual code um, as part of the compilation process. So it's sort of also additionally a layer, adds layer protection for your code. So that seems to have been a big request from our in our community. We don't yet do that for desktop. So in desktop, you can see all your HTML and JavaScript code when it's finally packaged. Um, but that's going to come up really uh, very soon in desktop. We're going to use the same kind of comp compilation step for that. Um, so we've talked a little bit about Titanium, desktop, Windows. We support all the way back to Windows XP, all the way up to Windows 7. Um, OS X, we support Snow Leopard and, and uh, Leopard. Um, in Linux, we support variants of PowerPC, uh, base Linuxes, uh, Intel based Linux is 32 bit, 64 uh, bit, and very soon we'll be adding ARM for, for netbooks. So the idea is that you'd build your app once, you could sort of maximum deployment across netbooks and desktops, and very similar in the mobile platform. Now, we all know this is not, we're not uh, Sun, no, no respect, disrespect to them, we're not trying to do Java. You know, this is not a run, you know, write once, run it anywhere, you know, no change to your UI, and micro miniaturize this. Um, that's not our goal. Uh, we don't think that's reasonable. Uh, we've all learned for uh, for many years that the, the form factor and the UI and the interaction is very important to the device and and, and um, 
So we don't want to promote that, and we don't think that's uh, necessary. The APIs could be very similar. Uh, you could package your project and reuse a lot of the same code, if not a lot, of, you know, almost all the code. But certainly the UI is different from a desktop application than a mobile application, um, and that's very important. We've also really tried to focus around, um, uh, again, a slightly different uh, philosophical standpoint. We want these desktop applications to look and feel and perform as their native counterparts. We don't want them to look, you know, um, one of the problems we've heard a lot from developers, both in legacy Java, swing type applications, as well as Flash, is that I can tell it's a Flash app, or I can tell it's an Air app, or I can tell it's a Java app. I just look at it, and I can tell that's what it is. And so we've really worked hard uh, to sort of give it a native feel. So in Linux, it uses GTK, uh, it uses all the native GTK widgets. Uh, in OSX, it, you know, it's Objective-C, it uses Cocoa, it, it looks like a Cocoa app, and, and, and Windows, you know, depending on which uh, variant of Windows you're on, uh, uses COM controls, things like that, so they look and feel like a native app. Uh, and, and very similar on, on, on iPhone, and I'll show you some of this a little bit more because I've got more uh, more uh, demos and screenshots around around mobile, but iPhone's very similar. The app, we don't want it to look like a web page that, that is just on the iPhone and on the Android phone. I mean, that's, there's not a lot of value to that, especially to the end user, and, and certainly Apple really does not want that, you know, as they, they go through the review process. So our goal was really to actually optimize the native widget tree and the, and the components and the controls on the device and give it the look and feel and help you actually build an app that feels and acts and performs like a native mobile uh, iPhone app or an Android app. And I'll, I'll show you some of the differences there and how that works and manifests itself. So we've talked a little bit about the programming model. I mean, the programming model is probably not too dissimilar, and that's sort of by design. Um, we don't have an IDE. Um, we have a developer product that I'm going to show you that's really for managing, creating your projects, managing you know, uh, the, the, the actual uh, debugging lifecycle and things like that. But, but you know, you're free to use your own IDE, whether you use Visual Studio, TextMate, uh, Eclipse, et cetera. Um, it's probably not too dissimilar to what you're doing already. I mean, you're writing JavaScript. You're using your favorite JavaScript library, jQuery, Dojo, et cetera, um, and you're using HTML, CSS, goodness to actually build that application. So we, we sort of sort of separate things from both kind of a UI, because sort of uh, in, in the HTML JavaScript world, we, we sort of try to cleanly separate the things, JavaScript being usually used for you know, programmatic behavioral type things in the application, and the UI being sort of defined by HTML structure, and CSS is the styling and, and sort of layout. So um, we've, of course, promoted and want to use the same uh, clean separation. So um, We've really sort of focused around UI being constructed around HTML and CSS, and, and we do have sort of JavaScript DOM access and native control access to certain capabilities, uh, native views, windows, et cetera, and we think that's very important. Um, you could, you know, very, very much like you do on the web, you might have a designer actually designing the application, uh, potentially even scanning it and laying out some of the CSS and HTML, and then, uh, you know, and then another programmer coming along and actually adding their own logic. We, we, we think that makes a really nice workflow. Um, it's not required, but certainly if you can support that in your, in your programming model, we think that's important. And so then, you know, JavaScript is used to use mobile features, to do uh, native XHR requests, things that you might do um, in a web browser, but with a lot of enhanced types of things that you're doing. And when you're actually invoking JavaScript in the mobile world, and, and, and the, for the desktop, very similar, you're, you're typically accessing things on the device. I mean, you're using the mobile API to actually do things like accelerometer or geolocation or, uh, you know, uh, rotation and things like that, or writing to a local database or things like that. Um, and you get to use your favorite toolkit. I mean, that's the best thing we think about it, is you're not sort of locked down any sort of specific API or, or I'm sorry, specific uh, tool set. We don't, we don't really have a tool set. We provide a nice API. Uh, we're trying to work with uh, all the great tool sets out there to, to con continually make sure they're optimized for, for uh, uh, titanium. So the assembly, as I talked about earlier, um, we use the SDK, which is sort of part of when you download our product, you get this SDK. Um, and um, Titanium Developer itself, and I'll do a demo in a few minutes, but Titanium Developer itself is actually a desktop application. Um, and uh, so we use sort of Titanium to build Titanium, and so it's sort of somewhat semi-recursive. So um, 
the, the, uh, the application assembly happens because the SDK compiles, uh, when you go to launch the application, it compiles your code, it, it does a bunch of work, it, underneath the covers is interacting with the, the, uh, the uh, tool chain, depending on what uh, mobile target that it's building for, um, and it builds your application. On the desktop side, it's a little different. I'll just sort of note this difference. On the desktop side, it actually packages in the cloud. So you can actually package locally for the operating system you're on. But when it actually goes to package, because of the different compiler differences and, and, and all the variants of, of you know, 64-bit versus 32-bit, et cetera, when you package, it uses our network to package. So when you click package on the desktop, it actually hits our cloud, um, compiles across, you know, we have a job server, set of job servers uh, in EC2 that will compile across all the different variant platforms, give you, uh, we use e, uh, EC2 and, and uh, S3 and, and CloudFront for all your distributions, so we give you all your distributions. You can then choose to actually use our distribution network for free, distribute your application, um, or you can just pull them down and, and just use your own distribution network or put them on your own website, it doesn't really matter. So we'll build you download pages and things like that if you want to use those. Uh, it's more of a convenience. Uh, and then we'll give you a lot of analytics about your downloads and your users and things like that if you do that. So um, on mobile, you don't have to go through that step because you already have the SDK on your, on your laptop. Um, it's required for iPhone development or for Android development. Um, that's not something we can control. So to talk a little bit about mobile APIs, um, a lot of people sort of uh, at first glance say, oh, well, but, you know, if you build a web app, uh, in mobile for iPhone or Android, then you don't get all these great things that I could do if I had written in Java or if I wrote it in Objective-C. Um, and of course, uh, that's not the case with Titanium. We support well over 200 APIs total um, right now in mobile, and we are uh, very rapidly uh, with velocity adding a lot of APIs, a lot of capabilities. Um, these are just sort of a what we call our high-level Titanium namespace. So these are kind of the high-level API namespaces that have been set up. Uh, we have things sort of, in some cases, we have kind of low-level and high-level APIs. A good example of that I'll show in a little bit is accelerometer versus gesture. Accelerometer is sort of like the very low-level accelerometer uh, APIs. Um, gesture is the higher-level sets of APIs. So if you don't, if you don't want to do all the mathematics and geometry, geometry and things like that to actually do accelerometer, you just want to say, when I get a swipe swipe or when I get a, a shake gesture or when I get a circle gesture, do some JavaScript action. Uh, we'll do all that for you, optimize, and it's cross-platform. But if you have some type of application that needs some special type of uh, control and, and special sort of uh, mathematics, then you can do that yourself. So that's a good example of sort of we'll give you sort of both. Um, very similar like database, you, we've got um, SQLite uh, database support, of course, in, the, in the, your application. Um, you can, of course, just do, um, you know, local databases. Um, or if you want to write to file systems and do kind of your own thing, you can do that. So, so building the UI, there's sort of... We like to sort of promote the sort of three styles of building the UI. Um, yes? Yes. Uh, th there's a platform API. There's, there's sort of various things. I don't go into it a lot, very, very much detail, and I excluded some of the additional. These aren't all the APIs. I just sort of excluded the ones that probably mostly matter. There's, a, there's an app API, and there's a platform API. Platform tells you a lot of things about the phone, the model of the phone, you know, network, uh, you know, supported devices, things like that. Um, application tells you a bunch of information about your application that's running so you can dynamically do things. Um, from a UI construction standpoint, we, we sort of promote, um, there's really two, but there's a one, the, the third is sort of a hybrid of the, of the two. HTML, I mean, you can just write HTML and, and use HTML and, and uh, you can take the native tab bar and the native, uh, native nav bar and the native uh, tab bar and you can then just put web content in there, and, and certainly there's uh, lots of good reasons to do that in certain cases, certain displays. Um, you can use fully optimized native UI controls, and I'll show you some of those. Like, for example, on iPhone, there's things called a table view or a group view. Um, they're highly optimized native UIs. Um, and, or you can use this hybrid, uh, we call it hybrid UI composition. So it's a composition of the two, where you actually, you, you actually construct everything in HTML, and this is sort of what we promote and what we would like for people to do, and, and people are doing. Uh, so you would actually author everything and lay everything out using HTML and CSS semantics. Um, but underneath the cover, what happens is when it's compiled, instead of using an HTML text field, it actually uses a native text field. 
Um, there's, there's lots of reasons to do that outside of performance even. So for example, if you, if you were to just use a normal native like in Safari web, if you were to just use a normal text field, input field, you only get one keyboard. That's a big, big problem if you actually have, you know, you want to enter a phone number, or you want to enter a password, you want to enter some additional types of keyboards. The iPhone supports seven or eight, nine different keyboard types optimized for the types of display. Um, if you use native controls, you get a bunch of, uh, you know, additional capabilities uh, that you wouldn't get if you were just to use with normal HTML. Uh, and we make that really, really seamless, and I'll show you some of that. Yes? It's, it's WebKit, so it really will support both. We don't really recommend, you know, XHTML, and it's not necessary. I mean, WebKit is uh, amazingly, I mean, you certainly will get potentially different, you know, quirks mode versus standards mode. You'll get different layout behaviors, um, and, and but, um, yeah. Yes. We have a, it's part of the compilation step, and it's part of the rendering step. It will, it will, um, it will determine and flow correctly and all that stuff. So, um, and, and I'll show you a little bit of that. So just as an education, I'll, I'll, I'll first show you sort of iPhone. Um, this is sort of the vernacular that, that, uh, that uh, um, Apple has come up with. They have things called the status bar, the nav bar. Um, you know, in the b below, most applications have a tab bar. These, are, these aren't all optional. Some of these are optional. Um, status bar obviously is not optional. That's part of the main UI unless you go full screen, so you can remove it. Um, the nav bar, or the tab bar, the toolbar, the content view is usually where you would have things in the in the application. Android, very similar conceptually, but very different from a UI standpoint as far as the way you would interact with the device. You know, most Android phones have a track track wheel. They have sort of hardware buttons. Um, which mean different gestures have certain types of capabilities and certain types of uh, things that happen. You have a menu bar, which generates a menu. You don't really have that sort of direct mapping concept in um, iPhone. Um, you have things like a progress bar that are, are in, in Android that will be done in the title bar, or you have activity indicators that can show, or status indicators can show up in sort of the status bar. You don't have that sort of concept in, uh, in iPhone. Um, you have tabs up top in, in Android. Um, you have tabs at the bottom in iPhone. So these are the types of kind of layout things that, that you have to sort of deal with if you want to really build an application across platform. And so part of what we've tried to do is we've tried to make the UI toolkit sort of help you actually lay things out that way. So if you say, I want to use a tab bar, it will actually sort of uh, lay it out in sort of the way that uh, works for the platform. Um, and we let you do things like localized resources and, and say, like, for iPhone, use this specific iPhone, uh, use this specific uh, uh, icon if, if, uh, uh, if you're on iPhone instead of this icon if you're on Android. Um, you don't have to do that. But that's, there's, there's things like that you can sort of tailor if you'd like to. Um, so in a real, real, real super simple, HTML is great. I mean, this is just a real simple... Uh, titanium application where where the middle is no native stuff at all. The top and the bottom are all native. Um, so, uh, but the but the middle content we just did a document right. I mean, this is really really super simple. Create a database, a document right, just to sort of take a screenshot. Um, native views um, are very common. I, I, most of these screenshots, I'm going to kind of go forward. I just sort of to simplify not to have too much repetition. I, I just did iPhone only, so sorry to Google, uh, but uh, I just did iPhone only for this. Um, there's what's called a group view, and you see this a lot in property pages and things like that in iPhone. Um, this is actually a native control in iPhone uh, in Objective-C with, with, uh, with things like you have button groups and input groups and things like that. You can add controls to it. Um, it's important to understand this is not a web-looking view. These are all native controls. I mean, th this isn't like, you know, it looks like it's native and it just isn't. It's, these are all native controls. Same with table view. These are all native. Yes? Now, it, well, you can, and I'll, I'll sort of show you how you can do po composites. Um, but uh, most of the time, you'll use actually a JavaScript API to create your native, and you'll use, uh, you'll still use HTML and JavaScript to, to actually lay it out and sort of say where you want things to go. But yeah, you'll use a JavaScript API for that. Uh, and the right side is a table view, and in this case, this is all pure native. Um, this is a composite view. Okay, so I can kind of 
giant pointer, but if, if you can sort of look at the top, this is HTML. So the top, the top header box there is a div that's rounded using just the normal CSS new sort of WebKit CSS rounding. Um, this is a middle div with HTML labels. Uh, it's a native slider, a native, uh, a native switch, and a native input field. And with native input fields, you get a lot of really cool things like the clear button, and you can control everything. Um, and then it's a native footer, or and I'm sorry, it's a it's a uh, HTML footer, just not another normal div, and they all flow and rotate and things like that. So this is what we would call composite UI. So this is what's sort of the best of both worlds because you can take HTML and, and mark everything up and control everything, but actually when it renders and compi compiles to render, it's actually optimized and uses native control. So. Yeah, I'll show you uh, some of that. I mean, yeah, you could, you could, you're right. I mean, you could just use an input field in, in text field, but then you would have a lot of restrictions um, to actually what types of inputs you can control and things like that. You could actually build, and we actually did in the one of the first uh, versions of our product we did, we actually built kind of a native switch in HTML. You know, it's not that difficult in HTML and CSS uh, outside of performance. Um, but uh, But now these are all native, so... The right side is the is the table view. It's a it's a native table view, but as you can see, the the content in the in the sort of the row one two three, it's all HTML. So all, all dynamic HTML that I've supplied, um, and then like things like the, the 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 right button with the blue, what's called a, a disclosure button, or or the right sort of indicator that will slide to the right, of, of course, and all the section headers. So if I were to scroll this up, the section header would remain until I got to the next section header and things like that. So um, it's all native. Yeah, everything's automatically provided, yeah. And some of this you can control. Yeah, I mean, on the left side, you could use fields and legends and things like that to do do that. Yeah. But, uh, but, but the controls themselves are native. Um, here's a group view example. I'm sorry, I didn't see. Sorry. There's sort of like, uh, there's some magic we're doing with sort of backing web views. We don't create web views for every, for every row because that won't scale. Um, but yeah, there's some magic. And, and we, get, we get sort of, the way Objective-C works for like a table view is it's not, you don't give it data and then it renders. Basically, it renders and it asks for certain sort, sort of data to be filled in. And so we can sort of use uh, sort of a hidden web view to sort of create great rendering regions and things like that. So we're doing a lot of kind of magic, and we're, we're constantly optimizing a lot of that. But uh, no, it's kind of difficult to explain without uh, getting really heavily into Objective-C. But uh, code's all open source. We can go look at it. Uh, it's a lot of, lot of, uh, lot of magic. Um, so this is, uh, I'll, I'll kind of walk you through. This is how you would create a, a group view. Uh, it's important to note where things, we've made an API decision where things that are very, native to the, the iPhone or native to Android, we've explicitly put them in a namespace called iPhone uh, and, or called Android. We, we made that decision after much debate on our list because we felt like we wanted to sort of uh, make sure the developer understood that they were sort of going down a path that meant it wouldn't be portable. Um, not, there's not that many APIs that are like this, but certainly uh, we made that decision because there is no such thing as a group view in, in Android. So uh, we also made that decision because we want the app to feel and be native and have all the capabilities. We don't, we don't want to sort of go to the lowest common denominator like we've had to, we've seen in the past uh, mobile web, where it just you know it's it's it's, it's just reduced down to nothing. So in this case, we're just going to say create a group view, add sections to it. I'll show you some of the subsequent code. Add section, add section, add section. So these are the sections, uh, you know, here button group, input group, and you can't see it, but there's a scroll below it, um, which is called an input section. Those are three types of sections. Um, you can do an open, so views, it's a stack. Everything in, 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 uh, in our world is a stack. You start with, a, the, with the root window, and then windows are opened on a stack, and when they're closed, they close on a stack. That's kind of how the mobile device works on both Android and iPhone. So in this case, when you create a group view and open it, really what happens is when you open it animated, it will slide, and you can kind of control the animation, the types of animation you want, but by default, it will slide to the left. 
um, on, on iPhone. Um, if you, uh, and when you open, and when you then close the window later, you can do group view closed, or when you're inside the view itself, you can say dot close. Um, it will then po pop it off the stack and you'll go back to the other view. So this is what a button group would look like. So I'm just gonna kind of walk through really quickly Option section, button section, input section. This is sort of like the summary object. I'm gonna kind of come back. These are these are the option sections. So just because I couldn't put it all on one page. So up to the right hand corner, button group, button one, button two. In a button group, you get things like a title. Uh, you can do as many buttons as you want, and you can do a footer. Those are all optional, um, but this is how you do it. So you would use uh, uh, you can use static data to construct it, or we also in the next uh, 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 update we're getting ready to do, you can dynamically change it as well. But Right now, you basically would say create a group section, you give it a header, the type it is, and then you give it optional data. Uh, and then you can add very similar to DOM events. We use pretty much this style of programming. Uh, add event listener for a click listener, which means when you click a button, it'll give you a call back and tell you which button you clicked. Input group section, um, let's speed up a little bit. Very similar, um, you've got lots of different controls that you can put native controls. So um, I, I don't have the code here, so uh, but, but for example, input type one up there on the left is that little iTunes icon. You just sort of said iTunes image. I gave it a switch instance, which is an instance of another JavaScript object, which I create a switch, or I create a slider, or I can create an input field. I can create a bunch of native controls, and I can just assign them as part of constructing this. Very similar at a, at a thing. So, oops. There's another one I'm not going to get into, but it's very, very similar. Uh, you got lots of native controls. These, are, these aren't all the native controls. These are just a couple of different types of native controls. So a toolbar looks like that. You control toolbars, flexible spacing, types of toolbars, system bars, et cetera. You've got tab bars. You've got status bars. You can control the status bar as far as the colors. Um, you've got what's called option dialogs down to the left side, which is like pickers. You've got you know, alert dialog boxes, um, switches, sliders, all sorts of cool things. Um, okay, so transition to other types of things. These are not non-UI, so you've got you know, database. This, we, we basically model this after the Google Gears database spec. Um, you can do asynchronous HTML5 database, or you can do synchronous titanium database. Um, we supported initially just HTML5 database, and everybody hated it. Um, so um, if anybody's on the what working group, er, that we absolutely hated it. People, um, because if you have any interaction with HTML5 uh, database uh, support, it's all asynchronous, meaning you do a query asynchronously, you have to pass a function callback for success and one for failure, and it just creates very, very nasty code. Um, so we, after many, many requests, uh, initially it started on desktop, and then we, of course, when we did mobile, we, we brought it over to mobile. We did, uh, we followed the, the Gears database spec and implemented that, which is very simple. You open a database, execute, 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 get result sets back, you iterate over them. It feels like a normal database API that's, that's rational. Uh, camera, uh, I, I'm not going to be able to go through all these. I'll just sort of show you some examples, show you how easy it is. I want to show the camera. So this could, would obviously be normally attached to a button listener or something like that, but I do Titanium Media Show Camera. I, I've got a, a number of callbacks I can give it, but for example, this is the just to be brief on the code. I get a success callback, so a very Ajax kind of like feel. I get an image object. I get a detailed metadata object. Uh, image object has a URL. Um, I can then pass that URL to file system, save it to disk. I can pass that URL to like uh, an insert on a database query. It'll, it'll correctly serialize the blob. I can pass that to an XHR request. It'll correctly do it as a form post. Uh, if you're posting it to a, a form, you know, like a multi-part mine uh, form post to a uh, remote web server, et cetera. So it's very transparent. You don't have to worry about any of that. The metadata has things like the image size, if it was resized, what their previous size was, if it was resized, and things like that. And there's a lot of additional options on the camera. Um, video, um, you can of course use, uh, in the iPhone and, and Android, you can of course use the video tag, which is sort of in a lot of flux right now. Um, or you can use our video API, um, Titanium, Media create video player. You give it a URL that can be a local, you know, movie on your resources folder inside that's compiled into your application, or it can point to a remote URL. Doesn't really matter. Um, and then you can do things. You can, we've got a whole set of uh, events like, you know, when it's complete or when it starts playing and things like that. That you can do certain things. So in this case, you create a video player. I hook it to a button. I hit play. It goes full screen. You get a full screen native video player. H264. Uh, you can do things like pause, resume, restart. You know, all those types of things you expect. Uh, there's also a sound API, very similar. 
Uh, gestures, we talked about gestures earlier. Um, sometimes you just want to know when somebody shakes. I, I want to know when I shake the app that I want to delete. Or I, when I shake the app, a lot of apps, well, when they shake the app, they'll use that as a refresh UI action. Um, you could do the accelerometer to do that, or you could just sort of, in our world, we've, we've come up, we're coming up with lots of different uh, UI sort of touch metaphors and sort of uh, gesture metaphors. Um, so you don't have to do all that. So you can just say chat same gesture, add event listener shake, give it a function callback, and you can do whatever you want. In this case, I'm just going to do normal get element by ID and just sort of tell you that you're shaking. But here's the alternative. If you want to do a accelerometer, of course, you can say uh, when the accelerometer updates, um, you know, it'll give you the, the, the X, Y, and Z space, and you can sort of do whatever you want to do with it. Um, so I think that's about, I'm running out of time. That's about it. So I'll do a demo. Um, if you want to know anything more about Accelerator Titanium, you want to join the community, download the product, it's free. Um, I will say that Titanium Mobile today, we made a decision to, um, to uh, desktop is completely open. Titanium Mobile, um, it's the same product. It's sort of just different ways you create projects. Titanium Mobile is, is in private beta. So if you want to get access, just come tell me or shoot me an email, and I'll give you access. So um, we've, got, we've gotten about 3,000 developer requests um, in the last four weeks. We've had about 1,100 mobile projects created in the last four weeks. We've gotten a lot of iPhone apps that are in the queue, um, as well as uh, Android apps. So um, we would love to, to talk to you a little bit more about that. So let me, let me do a quick demo. If I can, I hope I can. So I've created a project. I'm not going to go through that process, but uh, I'll just show you. I, I usually just create. Um, this is a real simple project that doesn't have any features. It doesn't have um, some of the stuff that just the normal stuff you'd have if you created a project, you know, readmes and things like that. Um, we really the main file which we generate for you, but you can easily sort of uh, configure is this simple TIF XML. It just sort of allows you to set your initial window or your initial tabs up. Um, just helps us. There's also sort of things that are kind of platform specific. So um, the iPhone is a good example. If you don't, if you're if you're not heavily using the network um, and you have no network activity, he'll automatically turn the radio off after a few seconds of inactivity. Uh, so there's things like persistent Wi-Fi to tell him if you have a Wi-Fi connection and I, you know, I'm streaming audio or things like that, don't turn the Wi-Fi radio off on my application, things like that. Um, but otherwise, you know, so it's you know, this is kind of a, a, a demo tutorial, so it's kind of well documented. But you know, you create table views, create some windows for splash screens, uh, etc. Um, so let's see. This is Titanium. This is Titanium Developer. Let's go and see what time it is. Um, so it, the project name is managing your projects. Uh, you create new projects. You can create a new project. It's what type of project you want? Um, you can optionally, if you like, we make it really super easy for you to inject uh, some popular JavaScript libraries, the latest JavaScript libraries. You can pick different versions of the SDK, um, et cetera. Um, and then uh, you know, mobile, for example, it'll, it'll help you make sure you've got all the right prerequisites on your system for iPhone, et cetera. We also have, uh, kind of cool to show off some stuff. You've got, uh, for example, we've done friend feed and Twitter and things like that. Um, into, into the product. Uh, we got a full IRC client, so our API supports on the desktop side. Uh, it supports all sorts of uh, different network stacks and things like that. We have a full IRC client. This is all written in JavaScript, um, so I just connect it to an IRC channel from within a desktop app, and it's all, you know, the, the IRC is simple JavaScript. Um, sandbox for, like, launching. If you just want to do a very simple demo, you can just launch it or play around with APIs. You can just launch it. Um, and then manage your profile. So in this case, um, I'll do a real simple, show you what it would look like. Um, normally you would have, when I created a project, I would have um, both Android and iPhone. In this case, because I just want to keep it really simple, I just did, uh, I just did iPhone. Um, so in this case, the kind of the way you interact is you've got, um, you can run the simulator, you can package it for your device, or you can package it for the App Store. So, and we sort of help you sort of get your certificate set up and, and sort of do all that, that not so fun stuff. Um, so right now, I'm just going to launch this app. In this case, because uh, we support also the latest 3.1.3 that just came out yesterday or two days ago, uh, beta, 
So you can choose. You can also, because I'm on Snow Leopard, this is Snow Leopard. Snow Leopard doesn't support 221, but on Leopard, Snow Leopard support, or on Leopard, you can also do 221. So this just happens to be a byproduct of I'm, I'm running Snow Leopard. So um, I just click Launch App the first time. It, you can see it's actually running the Xcode compiler. Um, it takes just a second, and then it'll launch the simulator. Hopefully you guys can see that. Okay, there's a simulator. Wow, that's a big simulator. Um, and that's that's it. I'll, I'll show you the code real quick. So you saw a little animation, things in. This is all native um, here. You know, blah blah blah. I'm controlling all this. Um, you know, native password, whatever. Okay, simple. It didn't really log into anything because it was a simple demo. But um, I can control things like the tent of the bars. I can control pretty much everything. You know, I can put system buttons, I can put toolbars, I can put I can put the slider up top, I can put images, I can put whatever. Uh, in this case, I'm using just a real simple table control. Um, and then I'm just going to go to a really super simple. Uh, this is all done. This is a com what was a composite view. So this is all HTML except, you know, these three controls here. Uh, in this case, I'm going to use our sort of sound API, you know, just to show like a really super simple uh, demo. And that's basically it um, from an app. This is just sort of showing you the tab view, et cetera. Now, um, to get on the phone, it's even easier. Um, so basically, I'm just going to click install. And what will happen is it just installed it on my phone. And it just takes a second. Um, and then now it's going to do a little thing here. It just syncs to push it on my phone. Um, I've got a ton of stuff on my phone, so it takes a little bit sometimes. Um, and that's it. Now it's on my phone, which you probably can't see, but if you'd like to come up and see it, it's now on my phone. Um, the demo. There it is. And that's it. And so you can then come play with it. Um, now, um, this would be slightly different for Android. The, the, the model is the same. You have a, um, you would use, there's a couple of set, when you have an Android project, you have a couple additional, and you can, you can mix and match. You can have an Android and an iPhone in the same project, and you'll have just multiple tabs. So when you launch the simulator in Android, it launches, of course, the emulator. We've, we do all the ABD creation and all that kind of jazz to really make it super simple. You don't have to do SD cards or any of that stuff. We do all that stuff for you um, initially. Um, so you can launch the simulator, gets the simulator up, same thing, deploys it on the a Android device. And then the packaging for Android, um, it, you know, running it on device, you don't have to do anything. You just tether it, boom, you're on device. There's no, there's no magic. They, they, they haven't gone the Apple route. Um, well, this is not computer code here. But, but, uh, and then for package it on, uh, to actually distribute an Android app, you just have to do a very simple self-signed certificate, and we'll actually help you create that, and, and then we'll do all the signing for you um, using your certificate and all that stuff. We'll just give you your key store and your password, and it'll automatically sign it for you locally. Um, and that's it. So I'll, I've got plenty of time, hopefully, for questions, a few questions. Okay, we'll start in the bottom. We'll come back up top. It'll it'll be the the it'll it'll work fine because um, it actually executes in the JavaScript. Um, it'll actually execute in the JavaScript interpreter on the phone when it actually uh, does it. Only things like um, native controls. Not a lot of the native controls. Um, the actual the compiler will separate like things like a closure or things like a function callback, and they don't actually get pushed into Objective C. So the event handler itself still lives in the Java uh, interpreter, yeah, when, when it's actually compiled. The only thing that's compiled is really the translation of the native control. So it's the there's, we have this sort of bridge between the native side and the JavaScript engine side. And so the, the, so the, so the JavaScript, the stuff that's got closures or function callbacks still could, will live in the JavaScript interpreter side. It's only the native controlling side that's actually then uh, compiled into native C and, and then translated into Java. Another question? Let me go to him in the purple. Um, so 
kind of under NDA, so I can't really talk a little bit about too much about that. So um, uh, maybe uh, the problem with the <laughs> problem that we see with the pre is that uh, the pre. The only thing I can sort of say about the pre, given that it's kind of out, is that uh, everything in the SDK for the pre is asynchronous. And that was a design decision they made. They, they modeled it after XHR. So they basically said, you want to know the model of the phone? You give me a call back, and I'll call you with the model of the phone. You want to, you know, you want to do anything that would normally sort of be in code synchronous or not synchronous per se, but sort of in line. Uh, they've made it. Uh, so on one hand, it's really probably more scalable from their standpoint, because theoretically they say that everything is running you know, in a true JavaScript multi or JavaScript single-threaded world. And you wouldn't want to block the phone to, you know, to sort of uh, to do JavaScript functions, uh, but that sort of makes it really difficult for us right now. And so uh, they have this sort of C API, and we're trying to sort of work with them on that. So um, we will be supporting other phones. Right now, really, our focus is uh, Android and iPhone. I mean, we really want to get that really well. We want to work with developers. We want to get a bunch of apps. Uh, built with developers and really just sort of get that working well before we dilute ourselves and move to other phones and things like that. I mean, I think there's enough demand right now for Android and iPhone. There's enough excitement around that that if we can sort of do that well, it'll be easy to do the others, I think, I mean, technically. So, and we don't, I mean, who knows what's going to happen here. I mean, we, you know, we're talking to all these manufacturers and the Android thing is just causing all sorts of pain for a lot of people. So, who knows what will happen to the market. We might not have some people around in a couple of years. Uh, you had a question over here, yeah. No, it's not bundled in every program. So we, we use a, a shared runtime. Um, so if one app has the runtime, a sub subsequent apps will use in both in memory as well as you know physically uh, not having to have multiple versions of the runtime. So only ever it only you only ever have one version of the runtime on disk for a version of our SDK or a version of our runtime. Um, you can do what's called, so you've got sort of two ways of packaging. You can do what's called a bundled package. That means it puts everything in one package. That's useful if you want to put on a USB key, you want to put it on CD-ROM, or you want to just sort of, I don't, I don't want to, I want to put my own sort of modules and my own things in there. Or you can do what's called a network or, um, you know, basically it's a network install. And then what will happen is it will, it will only uh, get the runtime if it doesn't already have it run through. Um, so you kind of get the best of both worlds. I'm sorry? Uh, yes, the, we, we basically, our model is around um, basically, you know, it's open source uh, code, open source community. Our model is going to be around building value around the application and working with companies that have lots of apps and lots of developers. So we have a free version. Uh, right now everything's free because it's beta and, you know, and we, we haven't announced the pricing. But uh, there will be a very, very low cost supported version of the product that comes with additional incidents and things like that. Um, there'll always be a free open source version, a community version, and then we'll have sort of the team edition for people that are doing sort of multi multi developer projects and more complex Androids and things like that. We got to make money. We're giving all the software away for free. So, I mean, the iPhone SDK against the iPhone SDK. Uh, well, uh, have you done Objective C before? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, it's a different paradigm. I mean, you're literally using, I mean, if you know HTML and CSS, even if, you're not, you know, even if you don't have t tons of experience, if you know the basics of uh, JavaScript, which is a very, very easy language for, for, to learn um, from a programming standpoint, um, it's, it's really super easy, um, you know, as compared to like doing an iPhone or, or even Java, for example. You only need to know conceptual. I mean, and we we've through our documentation, tutorials, and whatever, we basically say if you want a button or you want a text field, you know, here's how you do it. I mean, you don't have to know. In an iPhone, you have to know a lot more about nibs and all sorts of just different things. You've got, you know, I mean, Objective C is a C-based language. I mean, you've got to know retain and release cycles. I mean, it's it's you know, it's not. Uh, there's a reason that a lot of iPhone apps crash. Um, most uh, I think most of the developers don't 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 have an appreciation of memory management and things like that. So um, 
but yeah, we, we try to make it as easy as possible. I think, you know, we're, we're getting ready to launch next week an app, app U, and we're working with Best Hopes. I mean, you guys might know Best. She's a popular uh, iPhone developer around town, and we're launching a, a high school um, oriented training next week with a bunch of high school kids. It's easier to teach high school kids HTML and JavaScript because most of them are already hacking Facebook pages and things like that than it is to teach them Objective C. Um, so, I, I mean, you know, for us, it's about sort of empowering. It's not to say that objectives, you know, if you're going to build a game, you're never going to want to use our technology to do that. Um, you can build games. I mean, you can build basic games. But, if you're, you know, if you're going to build Spore, I mean, could, you know, you're probably doing even beyond Objective-C. You're using an engine that's using ARM assembly, you know, or you're using C, you know, to try to get the best OpenGL performance you can possibly get. So you got to kind of use the right tool for the job. But if you look at the most of the apps in the iPhone store, I mean, they're not Spore. I'm sorry. You know, the iFart app is not, you know. Uh, sorry. Wait, okay, I'll come back over here. We got – Michael's got a question. Yes. Yes. We don't know when, but we are we are doing pro some prototypes of that now. And we also have done some prototypes around uh, Google's O3D, which does run in desktop today, as well as doing some additional – um, desktop supports uh, Flash, uh, Flash and Silverlight, um, in, in addition to sort of HTML and JavaScript. So we've gotten a ton of just sort of Flash developers that are flocking into Titanium desktop because they get all these great APIs and they can still use Flash and, and, and Reflex and, and that development model. So, uh, okay, we had a couple more questions over here. Let me come back up here in just a minute, lady. Not yet. Um, we, we, iPhone's another popular framework. Um, we, we know those guys really well and, and uh, had long consideration of working with them to do this project, but we couldn't sort of meet. Uh, um, we couldn't sort of uh, – we, we sort of had a desktop product, and we had a lot of other things that we were trying to do from a technical standpoint and, and uh, couldn't really make that work. So um, we don't – we don't. We sort of take a different approach to compiling. I mean, you can't inject JavaScript into your app after it's compiled. I mean, it's you know. I'll show you on Git dependence. That's it. I mean, it's uh, there's no HTML, CSS, JavaScript. You can't inject JavaScript in. We, um, you know, you can of course access remote web services. I mean, and that's sort of totally permitted by the by the SDK and um, PhoneGap. Unfairly, I think. I mean, to be fair, got into some issues because people were trying to pull down remote content into a native frame and sort of do remote updates and and sort of kind of bypass the App Store once they got into the App Store, I think. And that wasn't really PhoneGap's fault. It was just their technology made that easy to do that. And they had some flags in their early technology where you could sort of make that happen, where you could just sort of remotely sort of do everything. And that sort of worried Apple and scared Apple, and, and, and they hate PhoneGap for some reason now. It's very unfair, I think, for all of us. Um, but uh, I think PhoneGap's a great solution. We've just taken a different approach. I mean, you know, so uh, uh, hopefully uh, competition is a good thing, I think, so. Okay, we had another one down here. Let me come to Hume because he had uh, he's been raising his hands a couple times. Partially, yeah, yeah. Well, that's what we're trying. That's what that's where most of our innovation is coming. I mean, you know, I think as you, if you saw the GWT compiler, you know, two years ago when Bruce Johnson and those guys started working on it, I don't know if there's any Google people in here about – are you? Are you? Okay. So, you know, they, they sort of started with the first generation, and GWT compiler has gotten better and better and better, and it can sort of probably write better JavaScript and, and can compile from, from, uh, from Java to JavaScript now because it's going a different direction than we are. We're kind of going from JavaScript the other way. Um, <coughs> You have to understand, we're not trying to 
we're not trying to, t trying to turn every function and variable into an Objective-C counterpart. We're only trying to map and translate the native controls and native UI pieces, and so the JavaScript engine is still in the mix. I mean, it's still in the, in the memory space. So it's a slightly different thing. We do, th we do things like uh, you know, take out white space, and we do a lot of that pre-processing ahead of time, but we're not doing anything fancy right now as far as a pure, you know, we're not using like Antler and building a pure JavaScript syntax tree and then trying to convert everything like they, they would do in the other way. Yes, you're right. In Java, it's easy to go from strong type language to not very type language. But, uh, but that's where most of our improvement, we think, will come from. And a lot of our innovation will come from that. Different data type. Uh, well, JavaScript doesn't really have. Yeah, I mean, what will happen in? in yeah, I mean, what will happen is in, is, is that it will the, the previous. I mean, it's, this this doesn't change, right? And any and, and this is the same even for our desktop with Python and Ruby. Any time in JavaScript you reassign a variable, the previous under under. <laughs> no, because because like I said, all the variables aren't aren't uh, translated directly into Objective C. Um, what we're translating are the native bridge call for the UI and the API calls and things like that. We're not passing data between the two, so it's a slightly different thing than, than a true, you know, bytecode compiler all the way around. I mean, it's not like C to assembler and things like that. So, uh, although we're, we're we're sort of looking at that. So let me come back to you. In a, in, go ahead, Michael. Yeah, yes. We use like four, I'll take, so uh, this is a, maybe a good illustration. So that when you when you do titanium.network.createHTTP client, uh, underneath the covers, that's actually creating a, a full Objective-C net, uh, HTTP net connection, you know, asynchronous uh, set of data objects and variables in Objective-C. Um, and that's all asynchronous. Uh, and then those callbacks can communicate across uh, uh, an optimized bridge that we've created back to um, back to the JavaScript runtime to actually, um, and we don't. I mean, there's certain optimizations we do where we don't have to pass data back and forth. So back to your closers question, we can keep a lot of that data up in the JavaScript space, uh, memory space, and we don't have to pass it because the, the if the, if the native side doesn't need the the data, it just needs to know that you know there's a there's a function on the other side that I need to sort of invoke once uh, an action an asynchronous action happens like headers received and, and XHR, it, uh, it doesn't you know, need to do anything. So, um, so we still have to contend, everybody will have to contend uh, with JavaScript as a single-threaded world, right? So um, you have to contend with that. We have to contend with that in the desktop side as well. Um, so like in desktop, for example, we have worker, uh, you know, a, a HTML5 worker, web worker type stuff, so. Well, in this case, it's a higher level API. You say uh, Titanium Network create IRC client, and you give it, you know, the host, your your NIC, you give it a bunch of parameters and port, et cetera. You give it a function callback, a JavaScript function callback that will be called whenever a NIC change happens. You know, there's a set of events. We don't support everything in the spec, but there's a set of events like NIC change, join group, you know, leave, uh, direct message, things like that. It's all is exposed in JavaScript as a programming API. The actual code and all the executions in this case is in C++ uh, on that side. Yes. And I, 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 I promise him next and then I'll come back. <laughs> Go ahead. Not yet. The, the biggest problem we're seeing right now is if you have heavy animation. Um, I mean, I'm talking about. I, I'm not talking about CSS animation. The benefits of a CSS animation is it's hardware accelerated. Um, so you get a lot of benefits out of WebKit even in in in, uh, in CSS animations. If you need to do something at high frame rates or um, you need to do things that you you know would need to be benefited by 3D uh, you know shading and 3D open space you know, you need to use OpenGL you wouldn't want to use our technology um, 
any kind of native controls or you know even simple games. I mean, we we we're sort of working on a prototype that's flight control. Have you guys seen flight control? Really cool. One of the top selling iPhone apps and games. It's like a really super simple like you land little. You just use the touch to like move planes around. You can land them on carriers and you know things like that. Totally can be done in JavaScript. I mean, it's you know it probably runs at 60 frames a second or something. It's really slow because the planes move really slow and you just sort of move the thing around and really simple drawing. It sold uh, in the first four weeks. It sold 700,000 copies in the iPhone store. So that that app can be built. Now, like I said earlier, you're not going to build Spore in in you know Titanium. So, but we don't have yet. What, what I can say from a data standpoint right now and the types of uh, – uh, so part of the private beta is we've asked people to tell us the types of apps they're building and the categories, and, they've, and we've sent out a survey, and um, we've gotten a lot of really good – and these are big companies. Um, uh, the top app in our category is, um, is utilities, um, and the second one is a business, and the third is – social networking. So it's like 14% of the apps that are being built right now in our world are utilities. Utilities are things like, you know, an extension of my mobile or my desktop product to, to or my web property to a, uh, a mobile device, um, things like that. Social networking, obviously we all know what that is, and, and, and business or business types, application, business productivity, and things like that. Um, those represent uh, business represents less than 4% of the iPhone apps right now. So what we what we are seeing is we're enabling a whole set of people that have never built apps for the iPhone store for whatever reason, probably technology, probably the types of apps, um, and, and exposing a whole new set of applications. Um, so, you know, um, you know, again, you could build iFart in you know, Titanium, I mean, if you really want to. I'm not sure the technology is the thing, though, that drives that app, right? I mean, it's... Like, like anything, right? Yeah. Yeah. But there's, yeah, if you use it for every prototype, what we're having is that our problem right now is we've got a ton of Objective-C people that weren't Objective-C people, but they built iPhone because they got on the iPhone bandwagon are saying, is there a way to go the other way? Can you take my Objective-C app and generate it into Titanium so I no longer have to do all this Objective-C stuff and I can crank apps out all day long? Um, but I invite everybody to download it, try it out. Um, Send me an email and I'll activate you um, and, you know, play around with it. And uh, I think we had another one more question, I think. We don't have uh, Ruby support or Python in uh, native or in uh, mobile. It won't, it won't work. It's for desktop only. It won't work, um, and that won't work because not technically it won't work. It won't work because Apple a absolutely explicitly, for, uh, you know, prevents that. They do not absolutely want that at all. So no interpreted languages in the in the demo. So yes, one more, and I think we're done. I'm sorry. So security, you have the same uh, cross-domain issues. Uh, the, the, the app runs in, an, in a file domain space, so it can actually access remote resources. But those remote resources, like, for example, if you were to include a remote JavaScript, can never gain access. Uh, almost 100% of that's given to you for free by WebKit. Um, they've got a really good security model. Um, from a the other side of security, somebody stealing your code. Um, like I said, we we obfuscate and compile the code, and and then we we AES, AES one twenty eight encrypt the actual source code as part of the compilation process. So um, I don't know what other security issues you're you're thinking about. Yeah, I mean, uh, like I said. You, when you build your app, most likely your 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 scripts are local to your to your app and are compiled into your app. Uh, you can control the the scripts that you give access to the DOM via via script includes, um, but that is no different than if you do it in the web or if you do it in any other type of browser model. It's the same security sandbox model in that world. They cannot gain access, for example, to a Titanium API. Uh, they cannot gain access to that. Um, hopefully. Please, uh, and if so, that's you know we we, we have to work with Apple and we'll have to work with uh, you know Google to to fix that because that's not a that's not a titanium thing that's that's given to us for free. Anybody? We had another. Yeah.
So one more question. We, we want to do lightning talks, right? So one more question. Yes. Apache. That's a great question. Apache public license. Permissive. All the way. All right. Thanks. I'll, I'll be around. So if anybody wants to talk afterwards, let me know.